frying pan. Is it omelet shadowing? Or is it fancy murdering that one guy shadowing? You know, we'll have to decide later. Where did it all begin? But the first thing American Ultra does so, so right is this score from Marcelo Zarvos and Paul Hartnell. This is the bookend scene, so this music applies more to the action side of the film that we're not gonna jump into right away. Also, again, if you have time powers, you could spoil the entire movie for yourself. And the second thing American Ultra does so, so, so right is the score. I can't say for sure, but it seems like the two composers split the score between them, each working on one tone. Okay, another movie like Oblivion where you probably haven't seen it, but I'm gonna pretend like you have because it's just more fun that way. So if Bourne meets Clerks meets Mr. and Mrs. Smith slash Dazed and Confused slash, I don't know, Warm Bodies? If that sounds intriguing, watch it or just watch it after it's spoiled because it doesn't even matter that much. I honestly cannot even remember my life before her. Okay, but that line is much funnier once you realize he may genuinely not remember his life before her since his new non-assassin life started with her five years ago. You can't help it, Mike. It's okay. And even though I love the action that's coming, their relationship is my favorite part of this film. And it even works when you realize it's not just because she loves him that she's so forgiving, it's because she feels partly responsible for him being this way, and the reason she's crying in the airport is not because she's upset with him, but because she wants him to push through and feels terrible that he can't. Well, so now that the omelet is over, it's skillet ricochet shadowing. I got you. Just pan guillotine shadowing. Also, Laffer's teeth shadowing. Okay, done with the foreshadowing wins. The visual language used in this movie is just generally aesthetically pleasing, but it also sets up the idea that Mike is always being watched from above, and then it's spelled out here with the satellite shot. I'm supposed to read this. I mean, I can't imagine why you wouldn't start on the first book. Rowling's redactions and revisions really didn't start till later. But what they didn't find out, which they'll find out in the next book, is that Fido Astro was also in on it. Like, I feel so betrayed. Mike even weaves his own story into his writing as if his subconscious is trying to alert him that Phoebe's going to betray him. I don't know, I mean, I really just like thinking about it and like talking about it, Apollo 8 and his adventures. Again, because Mike subconsciously knows something else is going on with his life and he thinks he's this terrified guy, he'd rather just think about the harrowing exploits of his character than actually put them on paper. So this car is always going and that tree is always just like, like stopping. Am I that tree? No. I think I'm that tree and I think you're the car and I think I'm stopping you. This scene hooked me into this movie, especially going in blind to the love story, how we go from typical stoner musings to an actually deep soul revealing conversation where Mike confesses that he thinks he's holding Phoebe back, which makes her immediately cry because she loves him so much and because she knows the truth is way more complex. There's only so much setup you can do for a relationship, but Mike tells us explicitly how important she is. She is the only good thing that's ever happened to me. He calls her during the day to talk about things he's passionate about and her reaction to his comic means she's invested in him and his passions. Not to mention he was trying to overcome a debilitating phobia to give her something he knew she wanted. The way they spoon conveys more love and romance than most drama movie love scenes. I really love their beautifully flawed relationship. Somehow, shooting a puppy, pushing an old lady into traffic, none of it compares to the one sec finger in the most aggressive and dismissive way possible. Now get the f out of my office. An exposition packed scene with very little explicit spoken exposition. Lassiter used to have this office. Oh come on, you're not at the big desk anymore. Yates has it now and we can safely assume that's because her wise man program failed, she was demoted, and Yates started his tough guy program off of hers, which is pr pretty on the nose. Well, I love her. You gotta give it all when you love like that, you know? Sometimes men say the most true and vital things in their passing the time small talk chit chat. Wanna draw some acid? Go inside the t bar? No, that's okay. I'm 8.15 in the morning. <laughs> Temporal awareness. My first thought was, who wants gummy candies that taste like mini cheeseburgers? But then I looked them up and obviously ordered some online. So I realized that they only look like mini cheeseburgers, but taste like fruit, which really just raises more questions. I'll have to get back to you. Hey, stop, stop doing shit to my car. <laughs> the way he starts out confident and then almost regrets opening his mouth by the end of the sentence. <laughs> oh, I love the pupil dilation that he's been activated and then back to our action score until they're both dead and the score immediately drops out. Did you call the police? Urgency because she wanted him to, or because she knew that wouldn't go well for the police or her, or him. <sighs> did this happen? Again, how did this happen is a little weird for the situation. Maybe it's a regional thing. But my first question would be, what happened? But how did this happen is a question someone would ask who already knew this was a potential outcome. I'm like freaking out all over the place, babe. I have like a lot of anxiety about this. The second thing this movie does so, so, so well is Mike. Mike is the polar opposite of what you expect from an assassin. His goofy jog up to Phoebe, the way he describes things. I spooned him in the neck and his sh just like... Ended. Even the things he's willing to admit. If you don't come here right now, I'm just gonna start like pissing in my pants. I swear to God, Phoebe, I'm just gonna start like pissing. <laughs> J 
Just making it clear these aren't run-of-the-mill assassins. Laffer is Creeptacular and also Boyd Crowder and oh man, Monique Ganderton is like the stunt coordinator and stunt double for everything you love. Relationship building in one gesture. She's his safe space and also his handler. Your probation officer must be the Michael Jordan of bull****. Because yeah, that, that makes sense when you're keeping someone secret. It's sort of hard to buy that Phoebe grabs the gun, but obviously it makes sense. She still can't overpower the super assassin because she just has normal person training. Although, frame by frame, you can actually see her ejecting the magazine, which is a nice touch. <laughs> Brutal. The guy in the thing doesn't see the gun, you don't point at it and go, gun. If someone who's trying to kill you goes, wait, you don't go, oh, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> I love both these dumb scenes. Why oh, Phoebe the gun? <laughs> And I love it even more that Phoebe calls him out on it as being insane. But even more than that, I love that even though his decision-making skills still suck, his assassin reflexes are tipped up. Let's just get in my car. And that was legit foreshadowed on their walk over to the car. I think I'm in the anaphylactic shock. That's not what that's called. Even when she's technically revealing she knows more than she lets on, it could go either way because Mike has some very large gaps in knowledge. And his lungs exploded. It wasn't his lungs. You got them all just... Sitting in a dark truck? Dofer always with the astute observations. There's inappropriate close contact with several test monkeys. <laughs> and he's not just happy ruining her name, he had to take it to the most petty level ever, saying she won't even social distance with a monkey. No, Rose, stop. I'm on quarantine, Mike. Rose, mm -mm, don't do that. Phoebe and Mike could be afraid of having a gun pointed at them, but they're actually scared because they don't want Mike to kill Rose. Hey, Rose? Yeah? I think I could probably break this lock. Please don't. Okay. You know? Friendship and compromise. Is uh, is Kristen Stewart even prettier in Blacklight? Is that, is that some kind of fetish? It has to be. Everything is probably someone's fetish. Hey, that's like the thing, the, the channel, my motto. Hope you feel represented today, Blacklight lovers. How are you gonna kill John Leguizamo like that? All I have to say to that is, -er. It's almost like they wrote this as the last straw moment. Come on, stoner girlfriend can kill a dude with a shotgun while dragging her boyfriend along? All the things she's known, even the fact that she got that gas mask on so fast, we know she's not who she says she is, and they appropriately clear it up pretty fast. I remember this, but I love you. You start You're free. Ooh, the sound of that headbutt is one of the most brutal things I've ever heard. I never really mind when deus ex machinas show up. Lassiter would be actively hunting Mike, so eventually she'd get there. But they even set this up. Thanks for the location on how. I'm heading to him right now. There's something really awesome about Phoebe's bloody lip. It doesn't feel like the strategically placed injury that so often lands on female actors' faces. Like, even their wounds need to be aesthetically pleasing. This isn't who you always were. The slow thinking, the inability to leave town. And just so we're clear, they did this to him. <laughs> <laughs> I love how casually Laffer just takes the gun back and holsters it. Badass good girl? What the f*** is wrong with you? Throw me now! Baby tantrum bad guy? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yep. Physics? Get out of here with your physics. The old uh, frying pan bullet trick. <laughs> Humility. Oh, it is. How'd you get tied up in all this? Well, you kill Uncle Ben, you die. Is the house not all on fire? No, man, the house is like basically normal. Topher versus Jesse is such a summation of this movie. The skinny guy with lots of training, but no field experience versus the skinny guy with, as far as he's aware, no training, but a lot of field experience, even just from tonight. They're both playing dress up. And even though Mike is Yates' nemesis because he's the physical representation of Yates just repackaging Wise Man as tough guy and he's also the embodiment of his failure since he kills all his assets, but Mike doesn't even care. He's just the guy on the phone. How do you accept a surrender? Do I need to sign something? <laughs> I love that he's just in his own world. That was really fucking lame. Sincerity. Even putting the Hawaiian shirt on is more about going to propose than beating the baddies. This guy is deadly. He is silent and he will sneak up on us. Mike's greatest asset is his terrible decision-making skills. It's like playing Soul Calibur against your button-mashing wife in college. I'm not bitter, you're bitter. <laughs> this long take using the uncut camera angle to surprise even us with his jump over the aisle. And Jesse did the majority of these stunts himself. This is an insanely brutal finale complete with protagonist emerging from smoke and slinking back into smoke scene. Oh, brutal. I'm sorry. I can't control it. Who told you what to do? Nobody. 
That must be nice. And then we end this crazy action set piece with a genuine moment between two assassins where the movie's secondary bad is shown mercy because they understand each other. Fun fact, it wasn't written in the script that way. In the script, Mike kills Laffer, which would have ruined his arc for me. All of this coming together the way it does, Mike seeing himself in Laffer and maybe not forgiving him but having mercy on him was a way to realize that even as flawed as he thinks he is, he's still worthy of Phoebe's love. And at the same time, they're all just victims of this system and he can fully forgive Phoebe as well, seeing a sliver of what Phoebe saw in him in Laffer. Pity mixed with admiration. And I really like that Laffer seems to have been slowly piecing it all together as well. I think this can still be read creepy, but it's almost like a childlike gesture to fix her hair for her. I also believe he meant this. Come out! I really want to talk to you. Now! <laughs> Come up, Ends. And then the Chemical Brothers for the clashiest of clashy tone songs that work so perfectly for how I feel about this love story with some comedy and fighting in the background. It's not the most conventional way to end a love story with faces bloodied to pulps, but I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Hmm. He's got fire behind them, spotlights in front, it's as perfect as any moment could be. But I think he realized there was no right moment. There was always going to be something in the way, so the right moment was now. Even with both of their faces totally messed up, no one looks cute. That's how you know their love is real. And I don't know if the X means anything, maybe just, hey, I did a movie called Project X, but it's cool nonetheless. Thank you. No, I'm hey, he wasn't right about everything. What's the punishment for treason? We take you outside and we shoot you in the fucking head. Also, that's two people Spidey killed. I don't know if this is appropriate, but please, please do not kill me. <laughs> Decorum to the last. You know, that's, uh... The whole idea that you would need to follow protocol even while you're kneeling in the rain about to die, it's just... <sighs> Makes you think, maybe it's time for some protocols to end. The puppy was going down, I was notifying you of the puppy's death. Oh, the puppy just shit all over everything. There's also a weird thing going on where the CIA likes dog comparisons a lot. Yates likes to call Lassiter a female dog a lot. Snipey overbearing bitch. Oh, bitch. You're my dog. And also he sort of treats his assets like dogs and then both President Pullman and Lassiter lean into the analogy when talking about Mike. Scary rabid puppy that murders people. Who actually writes a dog into his story who betrays Apollo Ape. The main character, which is also weird because Gates told the world that Lassiter had sex with an ape. You monkeys. Then you could maybe say Mike kills some guys like an ape and there's something going on here. My program work wise man. Be tough guy. Just in case you thought you were supposed to take this 100% seriously. That is a $400 million puppy. Where do you want to begin, Agent Howell? And I love the flip of the interrogation room not being an interrogation at all, but actually a debrief for the new active agent. Love? Yeah, love. Ah, he said. Do you get it? It's because he's man's best friend, not monkey's best friend. This is maybe a tad cliche, but I think American Ultra either works for you or it doesn't. For people like me, this and Mr. Wright are two really fun shoot 'em ups with a love story that I really enjoy and find unique. Thing is, I actually get it. I went back and watched the trailers again. There is a totally different movie being sold in them. Anyone who watched this movie expecting a stoner action comedy should be upset, and I'd honestly still like to see that movie. Like a Pineapple Express version of this movie with even crazier things happening and these two laughing it off because they're so high, or even like how Upgrade and Venom both made their main characters passengers to their violent murdering sides. But the fact that the two mains smoke weed is literally as important as Kristen's hair color. It's fun to look at, cool contrast in some scenes, but that's it does not impact the plot. They're never even high in the movie. Like, Mike smokes here and then still goes full ultra, so it wasn't the point. And I feel for the creators of this movie. <laughs> also, let's talk about how hard the trailer company tried to sell it. We'll take my car and we'll go get stone. Insider secrets here, but if my audio ever sounds like this, it means I chopped different takes together. So misgenreing the film was definitely one reason it tanked. I actually don't disagree with some of the opinions from a certain screenwriter. Original IP is hard to sell to an audience. And then if your ad says Skittles, but all you got is M&Ms, people gonna be mad. You'd be more likely to pull in Drive's audience than Pineapple Expresses. Punch Drunk Love also comes to mind because like I've said a thousand times now, the love story is actually the other half of the movie, not comedy. The love story wasn't an afterthought, it was the focus. And like I talked about in the beginning, their relationship is built very well right at the start of the movie. There's no need to sell that the situation made them close, as is often the solution. They are close and even the worst situations don't tear them apart. It's a love story backdrop on an action movie whose premise gives the main character god mode. So an action drama with funny actors who say the occasional funny thing. What if I'm like... Like a robot. All right, more than occasional. Babe, I'm not gonna sit around and wait on the judgment of your drug dealer. 
says. Also, just for the record, since I've nailed home the importance of the love story to me, there's definitely something to be said for the inappropriate and weird power dynamic between Handler and Handley. His amnesia sort of helps in a creepy way. But in a world where super assassins with no knowledge of their skills exist, I'm willing to suspend the normal hesitations on stuff like that. Also, their relationship is based not on who either of them was prior to the end of Wise Man, but who they are together after three to five years together. I really like their relationship. It was the thing I enjoyed the most after my first watch through. They're perfectly imperfect. And even now, the thing I like most about American Ultra is the very thing I've seen come up in multiple negative reviews for the movie. Tonal inconsistency, the movie doesn't know what it wants to be. <laughs> See, I think it does know what it wants to be, but it didn't convince everyone that it could be both. It's just so present in the score, I really feel that it wasn't a mistake. He doesn't work at a convenience store in Doug Lyman, West Virginia for nothing. In some ways, I think this movie wanted to be the next college dorm room poster mainstay. Shout out to the 10 of you repping it. Okay, this next bit might sound like a complaint, but it's actually not. We've been doing a lot of separation of art and artist today because it's my party and I'll censor if I want to. Mike Howell is a Gary Stu on a whole new level. He's like the most quintessential author insert character ever created. Is that a lyric from something? He should be in textbooks as an example of a Gary Stu. He works at a convenience store with no ambition, even refuses to attempt to publish his comics, but is an amazing writer nonetheless. And turns out to be an invincible assassin that not only needs no training or hard work he's aware of, he just knows languages and valuable information when needed. I could list like 50 types of tanks right now. When did I learn about tanks? He's so amazing, the CIA basically brainwashed him to think he was the tree when in fact he's the car. But not a Subaru, a one-of-a-kind Lambo, the one in a million, the only asset to even survive the training, and then he destroys an entire other team of upgraded assassins like freaking Kurt Russell's soldier, spoilers, without looking like Kurt Russell. He gets shot in the head and then kills more dudes. Hell, the main guy, the one guy who really gets any hits in on him, admits in the end. But you're better than me. The fact that the guy who wrote this character would have the opinions about other alleged Mary Sue characters is, like, Bizarre to not be deliberate, but after all that, it still doesn't actually hurt the movie because people love wish fulfillment characters. Apparently, we're just only used to seeing dudes do it. While we're talking about touchy subjects, is it worth venturing into the deliberate statement that CIA higher-ups are basically just mob bosses? Maybe someone should look into that. Oh right, we have absolutely no power in the fact that there could be even 1% truth in a scenario like this is actually terrifying in a way people scared of things like masks willfully ignore for their own safety? Or, you know, how this entire movie is actually based on MK Ultra, a real US slash German collab program that gave subjects multiple personality disorder to see if they could control them. No, it's absolutely not worth talking about that. I want to end this by talking about Case 2. I defended Kristen Stewart in a video like a decade or ten ago, and even then I tempered my she's actually really good just watch some of her other stuff position like I was afraid of the angry mob. So even I regret that because Kristen Stewart is awesome. Yeah, her mouth is open sometimes, and also sometimes it's not. I believed every moment of her character in this movie, and even more so on multiple viewings. I love that both she and Jesse allow their faces to be trashed by the end of this. The chemistry between them is amazing, and as much as I think Jesse had a big part in that, Kristen nails it home at every turn. Like, Mike is the main character, but is he? I don't know, maybe that's why I love their relationship so much. She doesn't pull focus on purpose, she's just like radiant, I don't know. And I'm not talking about her being pretty, I'm saying that the movie revolves around her presence. Kristen Stewart is a great actress, full stop. And Jesse was perfect for the non-badass badass. He's just scrawny and goofy enough to make it so ridiculous that it works. The rest of the cast is fun. Connie Britton is just like a solid actor, and even if Topher will forever be Foreman, uh, he was pretty hateable in this. So go watch it if you haven't. I can't believe how many of you say you watch movies for the first time after these videos, but I'm also really glad you do. Next week, a newer one of which we are going to run out of at some point, turning into a weird year. Cherry Progressive, listen. Is that a lyric from something? Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose.